Welcome to Expanding Perceptions. Uh, today I'm with a friend of mine who we've done a previous interview with that I, I really enjoyed and I want you to check out his previous interview if you haven't. I'm talking with Jim Willis who's an author, a researcher. He's written over 20 books on such topics as ancient history, spirituality, personal development, many other uh, fascinating uh, threads he covers. His uh, re recent books are such titles as The Quantum Akashic Fields, Censoring God, Ancient Gods, Lost Histories, and The Conspiracy of Silence. And today, uh, Jim and I are going to discuss something that I think is one of the most pressing issues that we uh, deal with it, as far as being human and humanity in general, and that's the uh, this ego's struggle for dominance. Now, this uh, is all based on some recent books he's written. He's written a trilogy of books where he takes uh, well-known and lesser-known archetypal imagery and stories and sees how these stories are kind of... Um, inspiring us to look beyond ourselves and to see a, a greater picture. So he pulls from such uh, classic stories as Little Snow White, Robin Hood, and Merlin the Magician. So, uh, Jim, yet again, thank you for talking oh, to me today. Great to be with you, Paul, as always. Yeah. Well, let's just jump into it. <clears throat> ego, the term ego, depending on what you read, uh, you know, what you follow, whose idea can take on many uh, different uh, terms. You know, you talk about having a, a strong ego that could be seen as a positive or negative, depending on who's uh, making that uh, distinction. You know, Freud uh, idea of the ego is much different than uh, some of the later humanistic thinkers idea of ego as self concept. So what is kind of your perspective on ego and how that uh, runs a thread through this, this recent trilogy of books you've written? Uh, let's jump in at the very beginning. Um, I think in order to get at ego, we have to go all the way back to consciousness. Um, consciousness is a, a field of study today that is all over the map. Uh, there are those who believe that consciousness emerges out of biology and chemistry and that when the biology and chemistry of our body dies our consciousness evaporates i can't come to accept that um, i i honor those who believe that way because um, they put up some very convincing arguments within their own frame of reference but I think that anybody who talks that way has got to be talking within a frame of reference that I call materialism. Uh, and I like to go beyond that. Uh, I don't think consciousness emerges from biology and chemistry. I think consciousness is the beginning. Uh, consciousness is all there is. Uh, some You might call it God, a uh, different understanding of the word God. Um, but consciousness I think produces the biology and the chemistry that gives us the illusion of where we are. Now, that being the case, I guess I have to go into my own little thing called a slice of reality. I know I'm, I'm going the long way away to get around to your question, but um, obviously we, we can't understand what goes on beyond the materialistic world in which we live. We are... Uh, either cursed or blessed with a three-dimensional mind and our language comes out of that expression so we can't really understand what goes on afterwards uh, after this or because outside of this three-dimensional reality that that we live in but i've uh, produced a kind of a thing that i call a slice of reality that leads us from consciousness to ego uh, I call it a slice of reality because a picture of a revolving circle or uh, how about this picture of a piece of, I mean, a picture of pie, a round pie. Start in the very beginning of this pie that's going around in a circle. There is a still point at the beginning, at, at the, the middle of this that is, is not revolving uh, or not revolving as, as quickly. And that's still point is what I like to call the source. Uh, earlier in, in when I was a Christian minister, I called it God. 
Uh, it's the beginning of all that is. It's that stillness, that perfect unity, the oneness where everything comes together in perfect stillness. Uh, it's it's a wonderful, beautiful concept of, and, and you hear people who have had near-death experiences explain it when they talk about peace, when they talk about uh, love and joy and contentment and all of that, acceptance. Um, there is no me and you, there is no individuality, there is no ego, it's just simply one, all is connected at the point. The one thing that we can't, that, that the source cannot do or, or provide is give us a feeling of experience. Uh, how can there be any experience when there is only perfect unity, perfect peace? So I think the way I like to say it, and, and I'm not I'm not coming up with a new religion or anything like that. I'm not, I'm not insisting that this is the way it actually happens. I'm insisting, I'm, I'm just presenting this as a, um, a common idea, a metaphor for to speak. For, so what happens? Let's picture pure consciousness, perfect unity, perfect peace, perfect contentment, perfect oneness. And let's say that that perfect consciousness wants to gain for itself an experience of a reality that is outside of itself. It has to move from that perfect point of stillness out uh, eventually to where we are. I call it out here on the edge or out on the rim. And so I like to picture it as going through three different um modes of reality, three different perceptions or three different uh, dimensions, let's say it that way. The first is uh, what I call consciousness. Source develops a consciousness. I, uh, uh, I, Albert Einstein and uh, uh, Stephen Hawking have called it the mind of God. Uh, there in consciousness, there is still no individuality, but there is the awareness of indiv that individuality can exist. Plato talked, for instance, about uh, hoarseness and horse. Uh, in, the, in consciousness, in the mind of God, a horse does not yet exist, but hoarseness exists. That's what, what, what Plato was talking about, the concept of what a horse is. That's consciousness, the mind of God. It is the conception that there is more. Now, individuality, ego does not yet exist, but there is the perception that it can. So in order to move out of that dimension, out of that mind, it has to move through a field which transforms it. It's moving through what I like, what I, I think is is uh, recognized now as the Akashic field. Uh, the Akashic field is the place of infinite possibilities, of infinite probabilities. Uh, that's where the conception of what can be and what must be comes. When we move through that Akashic field, let's put it in simple terms. Let's say we our energy slows down a little bit. And as we move through the Akashic field, we come to another dimension, which I like to refer to as quantum reality. It's been discovered and checked out now for the last hundred years. Uh, probably one of the most well-known um, realities, let's say, of science in terms of mathematics. Uh, if, if quantum reality gives you trouble, let's call it thoughts and intuitions. That's where we begin to take on a little bit more form. Uh, from quantum reality, we move out once again through the newly discovered Higgs field. In the Higgs field, we are told that our energy slows down. Uh, here in the United States, scientists like to talk about it going through a field of molasses, the Higgs field. Or in England, they might talk about uh, treacle. I've never had treacle, but I guess it's something like molasses. And the idea is as we as that energy moves through the Higgs field, it takes on uh, body. It, it slows down. It takes on materialistic things. So when it emerges from the other side on our side, which is that third uh, dimension, which is material reality manifested uh, out here where we live, all of a sudden now 
we reach the fruition of what it is to be removed from the source. We've slowed down. We've gone through three different dimensional fields and, and two different other fields, the Akashic field and the Higgs field. And out here uh, is what I like to call the material reality manifested. Uh, I like to use the term perception realm. Uh, we know that everything we see is an illusion. Uh, we know that the old song, row, 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 your boat was right. Life is but a dream. Uh, we know when we're seeing a desk or when we're seeing a tree or a cloud, we're not really seeing that. We're seeing our perception of it. Uh, if we get in closer, it turns into almost like pixels on a computer screen, you know, that kind of thing. And and so we're, we're seeing a, oh, an agreed on... Uh, perception but to us it feels real it seems real and here in the material reality manifested here in this perception realm we can experience something which we never could have experienced back at the source and that's individuality and i like to say that individuality and ego are the same thing so when i'm talking about ego in this trilogy um, uh, individual and primal unity um, I'm talking about the idea of ego uh, being synony synonymous with individuality. So I don't want to get the idea that ego is a bad thing. Uh, I, I don't think it is at all. But ego can be nourished badly. Let's put it this way. It's like a tomato plant. You know, you, you grow a tomato plant. We know that in order to produce fruit, you need to put nitrogen fertilizer on and it's great and it works and it gives beautiful tomatoes. But if you give it too much nitrogen fertilizer, if you feed it too much, it has this gorgeous big looking plant with no fruit on it. And I think in our age, we have come to the point where we almost have to battle ego, not because it's a bad thing, but because this age uh, gives us so many temptations to feed ego to give it too much nitrogen so to speak and it grows these great big plants uh and but no fruit uh, and we live in a time where i think ego is uh especially dangerous we have to come to understand it otherwise i think it can possess us because ego lives in a land called narcissism and it's very e easy for ego to become narcissistic. And I think uh, that's what's happening perhaps in our age more than any other age. And I like to say that it's a lot of it is because, frankly, of the internet. The internet is a wonderful thing. It allows me to talk to you. But on the other hand, have you ever had the feeling that I did that, uh, you know, I came out here in the woods to get away from it all, to get away from the temptations of ego. I was a minister standing up and speaking, and I was a college teacher giving lectures, and uh, you know, I had a lot of adoring fans and everything else, and I and and, and I could see that uh, it, it's very easy to feed an ego, but now. Anybody can do that. <laughs> a couple of years ago, I was looking at my computer. Uh, I had come out here in the woods to get away from it all. But uh, then I started writing some books. And that meant doing some podcasts and interviews and talking to people. And of course, I had to have a website. My manager insisted I had to have a website. And so my daughter, Jan, put together a great website for me and everything else. And I found myself uh, with a Facebook thing and a YouTube page. And I found myself getting up in the morning, staring at the computer screen and wondering, man, how many people read my post yesterday? And I felt just like the wicked queen in Snow White, mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all, you know, and all a little thing popped into my head, something like a computer, computer on the desk, who's better than all the rest, you know, uh, in the morning, if I had a bunch of hits, and you know, a lot of people looked looked at what I posted yesterday, oh, man, I felt great. And if they didn't see it, I said, Oh, no, what did I do? And it's the same, it's the same kind of thing. It feeds our ego, Facebook and Twitter and all that kind of stuff. It gives us all uh, our 15 minutes of fame, but this time he gives it to us every day, you know, and I, I was amazed at what I was discovering about myself that I come out here in the woods to get it all. 
and I bring that with me. And for a while, you know, coming out of a Christian tradition like I did, for a while, I was I was beginning to think of the ego as a demon that had possessed me, you know, demon possession. And then I realized, no, wait, you can't have individuality without ego. The definition of ego is that sense of individual individuality. The problem is, what have we done to ego? And I think in our age, we are pushing ego um, to the point where many people have stepped over that line into that nebulous field called narcissism or even pathology. And now I'm getting into your field. You, you know the words much better than I do, but that's a, a long answer to a simple question. But I think it's the only way we can really attack the idea of what do I mean when I say ego? Well, and it's, as you're, you're saying that, I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, the old, um, uh, alchemist who would use the metaphor of, of transmitting things into gold yeah. and they're, they're talking about balancing elements and things like that and the balance of uh, a healthy sense of individuality mm -hmm. with a healthy sense of of uh, social responsibility or mm -hmm. just even not getting ahead of yourself it's like a, I was talking to a guy one time he says that he had a this awakening moment he said I realize that I am this amazing, creative, super force in the universe. Yeah, That's yeah. the greatest thing ever. And then he smiley says, and just like everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. I was, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day. We were talking about this very same thing. We were sitting on our front porch and uh, and she said uh, she was talking about my latest uh, YouTube video, and she was talking about. She said you you've really got a, a a great following. You put out something out there, and I said yeah, yeah, um, but it's it's tough. And I talked to her about the idea of wanting the numbers and wanting the feedback and all that kind of stuff. And she said, yeah, but you have basically a humble soul. And I said, yes, I do, and I'm so proud of that. <laughs> That sort of reminds me of that old uh, song from the uh, early 80s, uh, the country singer, uh, Mac Davis, and the, the song was, uh, Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're as great as I am. You know? so, <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I love it. So with this whole idea of the ego, as, as we have uh, kind of uh, operationally defined yeah. it now, yeah. This issue of balance is something that uh, human beings <sighs> seems like from day one. Exactly. have a struggle with and as you say uh technology with all its amazing benefits and i guess here's the balance too it's amazing benefits mm -hmm. amazing drawbacks um can foster this feeling of um, uh, the ego needs to be constantly replenished you yeah. know it's like yeah. when is it enough and then yeah. for some people who can't be replenished because it's always something more and more then it has to be more extravagant attention and mm -hmm. more extravagant need to control yeah. things yeah. Could you talk a little bit about that yeah and it, it is i think you put your finger right on it and in in this age we have invented a way of life that quite frankly is not uh natural in, in our evolution. For thousands of years, Homo sapiens has uh, been around at least 200, maybe 300,000 years, and millions of years, our ancestors. Um, we were tied to the earth. Uh, we were one with the earth. We were closer to the earth. And now we have developed a way of life within the last hundred or few hundred years that is totally opposite to everything that our evolution has prepared us for uh this technological way of life uh, just for the fun of it um i i had a, a meditation experience today uh, i go out to my little gazebo out in the middle of the woods that overlooks my medicine wheel and i was sitting out there and i had the idea that um, magic was just around and I was meditating with my eyes closed and I felt the presence of some kind of magic, a connection with the earth. And I opened my eyes and there was a herd of six deer going right by the front of the, the um, gazebo. Now I've always associated deer uh, anthropomorphized it, I suppose, but I've always associated with deer with magic because, you know, 
at least at the beginning, uh, before I moved out here full time and they got used to me, you, you never saw them, but you saw the evidence of them. You saw their footprints. They ate the corn that I put out for them. Uh, uh, you know, and and you see it, when you see them, it's just like a, a glimpse. And that's kind of our feeling with what I like to call earth magic. You never, you never really see it, but you just see the evidence of it that it leaves behind. So as a result, it was a, a powerful meditation. So I came back inside and I had the television on to see what news happened. And I decided just for the fun of it to look up, uh, to, to ask for YouTube uh, on spirit animals. And I thought I would get into uh, all kinds of Native American mythology and everything else. But the first YouTube video that came up was this woman who was teaching me how to identify my spirit animal. And she was in her kitchen um, with everything shiny and chromy and everything else. And there wasn't a plant or anything natural in the thing. And I said, this person is going to teach me about spirit animals. And I just turned it off. I didn't, it may have been a good video. I don't know. I didn't even listen to it because this woman behind her was the backdrop of, of a sterile, um, materialism, totally divorced from what evolution has uh, made us to be. And I think in, it, 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 to me, symbolized what uh, our problem is today. We've developed a way of life that is simply not natural. Uh, that's where Merlin the Magician came from, the first one of this trilogy. Because in Merlin the Magician, uh, we have a wonderful story. I mean, uh, the, the Arthurian legends are, are just so rich in, in meaning. But we have that wonderful story of Merlin, who was the magician who was in touch with the earth. And uh, he could do things not by doing magic, but just by being Merlin. And you get the idea when you see Merlin, you get the idea of, of oh, dripping moss and, and thickets and woods and all this kind of stuff and all this, this sense of being one with nature and uh, being one with Mother Earth, being one with Gaia. But the story goes on to, to tell the story about how Arthur, uh, who was uh, raised in that same kind of pagan Merlin magic, became a Christian. And uh, uh, it, it's this, it eventually, to make a long story short, uh, you have to read the whole book, Merlin the Magician, to get to it. But eventually what happens is uh, Christianity and the modern sterile lifestyle, Christianity, which takes place in a, in a church, in a cathedral, in a city, uh, it eventually wins the battle over nat over nature and the what I call magic or our perception of, of things that Jung, for instance, would call serendipity. Um, you have that uh, that battle between the old style nature religion magic and the new style Christianity uh, cities and all the rest of this stuff. And this is an old story. I mean, uh, we read about Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And the story is that um, they got kicked out of the Garden of Eden where they were one with each other, one with the land and one with God. And they had two kids, uh, Cain and Abel. And Cain killed his brother Abel. And what's the first thing he did? He went out and built a city. Uh, so again, it's it's that being cast out of Eden. It, it's being put in a place where we're not. And I, I think the modern world really suffers from this lifestyle that we have invented. It's not natural to get in a car every morning and drive in five lane traffic with uh, polluting the atmosphere and being stuck behind traffic lights. It's not it's not even natural for, for kids to take all the wonderful exuberance of youth and put them into what basically has become a, a, a prison. You got to have a metal detector to go in and you got to stay in one class and sit in one place. And some kids just can't do that, you know, and, and you have to sit in one place until the bell rings. Then you got to get up and move to the next place. And if you don't go, you know, you're paroled every night, but if you don't go back the next day, they send the law after you, you're, you're a truant. Uh, it, it it's, it's a whole lifestyle that is so totally unnatural. And yet, when we look at it, because it happened gradually, and because we saw it happening, you know, slowly, a little bit, uh, day by day, we got used to it. And now we call it a natural thing. And it, it isn't, I don't think. 
and uh, it it goes against the thousands of years, at least probably millions of years of our evolution, and it cuts us off. And Merlin, the old dragon, you know the old dragon religion, uh, with a roar and and all that. Merlin, just like another famous dragon, sadly slipped into his cave uh, when he was needed no more. But but he's still alive. He's still there in the crystal cave. He's waiting to come back when we need him the most. Uh, and I, I really do believe, I, I, I've come to believe this with all my heart, that we can recapture that old natural religion, but we have to work at it. And we have to be willing to put in the time and the effort. I came out here to live in the woods after I retired. And I was my plan was to live for one year out in the woods, be a hermit watch the seasons change and i thought well one year will be plenty well it's been 13 now and i'm still just beginning uh, i still have those what i like to call the magical times like this morning during my meditation and and uh the times when oh something happens uh, an animal shows up and you look at that animal and you know you re you realize through native american mythology for instance what that animal means and then sure enough boom, it happens. Uh, I think it's there. I think we've just forgotten how to use it. Does that, I don't know, does that make sense? I, I, I... Makes perfect. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Something jumped out at me as you said about Merlin is that you said Merlin in the beginning, he was doing all these uh, amazing things and, you know, he wasn't doing stuff other than just originally just being Merlin, mm -hmm. being who he was. Yeah. To me, this is a, a fundamental thing with this battle of, of the negative aspects of ego is our society, our culture, and certainly the technology almost requires us yeah. to be somebody different than many of us are to be seen as, as successful or going back to, um, I mean, YouTube and social media is an easy target, but it, we'll just use it. Uh, the the younger people I see a lot, maybe older too, but they're putting up pictures of them being successful. And and that we find out sometimes that some of these people who have, you know, 100 million followers or something is a bit of a a, 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 a scam, if you will. They, yeah. they really didn't have that gorgeous apartment. They just went to someone else's apartment and took pictures and made it look like they were, yeah. oh, they're not really that uh, naturally charismatic. It was just, you know, that they would take uh, clips and, and put it together and, you know, mm -hmm. set things up. So to say that who you are is not enough, you have to be something else. So ego then says you inherently aren't enough based on the messages they're given. You know, yeah. um, I thought about uh, Elvis Presley who, you know, I'm a big Elvis fan coming from the South, you know, mm -hmm. but I think the reason Elvis was, was so popular was not obviously, certainly because he was one of the first of, of the rock mm -hmm. and roll, but because he was always Elvis, that he mm -hmm. had a natural charismatic quality to him that no one else had. And when you watch early Elvis and even later Elvis, you can still see Elvis in there. Yeah. And I say, yes, he had incredible talent and an amazing voice, but he had this, this inherent quality that we saw him, mm -hmm. whereas so many other uh, performers, we get glimpses of the show and we don't ever really feel like we, we, uh, we know that person. So yeah. when you said and Merlin was just being himself, that's pretty profound. Yeah. Well, you know, look at Elvis uh, when he was being himself. Look at the meteoric rise, and uh, then other people took over, and uh, he had to be more, 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 and it killed him. Uh, it says something. Um, I've had, I'll, you know, being a musician all my life, I've had a number of wonderful music experiences that I remember, and two of them, which I can't help but contrast. Um, the first happened when I was in in, in high school. And I won uh, a concerto contest playing trombone. And I had a chance to, to play as a high school student with a symphony orchestra playing a trombone concerto. And I got up there in this stage and I was all dressed up and all this kind of stuff, you know, and I played my trombone. And I look back right now and I realize that um, 
something happened when I walked out on that stage. I was just somehow determined, um, mind over matter. I wasn't going to make a mistake, and I was really going to play. And at the end, uh, I, I gave what up to then was the performance of my life. Yeah, uh, to this day, I mean, I've heard recordings of it, so I know that I didn't just imagine it. I I, I know it was good. And at the end, um, I didn't realize there was a uh, an audience out there or anything like that. I was just caught up in the music. So at the end, I finish, and there's a moment of silence, and then there's this tumultuous applause from a couple of thousand people sitting out in the audience. And I, of course, gave this big bow that musicians are taught to give, you know, I am not worthy, you know, and all that kind of stuff. I hadn't been off that stage for five or six minutes before people were telling me, oh, great job, fantastic job, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And I realized at that point that I hadn't, while I was doing the music, I was playing it just to play the music. The music was the main thing. I felt like a channel. As soon as it was over, I realized I had used it. I had used it for a purpose. And the purpose was to puff me up and made my ego feel good. I contrast that with a group of old fiddlers that uh, I used to play with, two old guys I used to hunt with, and they were just country fiddlers from the front porch, you know? And I used to go over with my guitar and uh, my wife played bass. And uh, one of the fiddlers had a uh, sister who played piano and we'd go over in there in the living room and we'd just play fiddle music, bluegrass. And uh, it was great. It was just wonderful. And we would finish one of these things, which was really, I mean, I was a student at the Eastman School of Music at the time. I could recognize good music. And these guys were good. They couldn't play Rachmaninoff and Tchaikovsky, but man, they could sure play The Devil's Dream, you know, or, <laughs> or some of those jigs and, and stuff. And when we would finish this piece and we would just be clicking, it would just be great, good, good, good stuff. And at the end, nobody would clap. Nobody would say, oh, aren't we great? You know, and we have to get out there and show this to other people. We were playing the pure essence of what music was. And there was no room for ego in there. And I look at those two and I realized how much in my life, how much in all of our lives, we do our job not to do the job, but because it enhances our ego in the minds of others. And that becomes dangerous. And I think that is the kind of life that we have. Um, I, I guess what I'm saying is we, we got to get off the concert stage and go back on the front porch and you say, oh, but not as many people will hear it. Well, so what? You know, uh, it, the music is, is, is the main thing. Our lives, we are here to make music for music's sake. Uh, and I'm not talking about music. I'm using music now as a metaphor, whatever it is, whatever our own thing is. If, if mowing the lawn, you know, if we do we mow the lawn because we want to make it look good and, and take care of it, or do we mow the lawn because we want our neighbors to say, oh my, what a wonderful place he's got. It's, it's subtle and it's a constant trap and we constantly have to work at it. It's difficult. I'm not going to say it's easy. Um, people say, well, do you have an answer to it? Yeah, I got an answer. We all got to work a lot harder at it, but it's, it's tough. It really is tough. You know, as you're giving that example about the fiddlers and all, I'm reminded of um, uh, uh, Jerry Reed and Roy Clark, uh, the musicians, oh, yes, and how yeah. they would have so much fun on stage doing what I call the good old boy shtick. Yeah. And boy, were they funny and everything. Oh, and, yeah. And the, the average audience, you're there to enjoy the show and you go, oh, well, they're very good. But someone like yourself knows that those guys were very serious musicians. Oh, yeah. Incredibly skilled. Yeah. And yet they were able to find that 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 balance between, yeah. you know, the musicians going like, wow, and the audience who, who can't, you know, they, they just don't know technical brilliance like a musician to just yeah. laugh and enjoy it. And uh, yes. that's, that's, yeah. to me, that's a metaphor in a way for life. How do we balance those kind of things? So I want to ask you this, looking at the bigger picture of our society, our culture, I don't mean specifically the United States. I'm talking like the mm -hmm. world. So much of ego drives amazing uh, technological developments, medicine, those kind of things. 
but at the same time, we're kind of also destroying uh, elements of the world that that support us. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about how do we balance moving well, forward? You've you just moved from Merlin the Magician to Robin Hood. <laughs> That's the theme of the second book of the trilogy. Um, Robin Hood is um, a man of uh, who was born of the city. You know, he was he had a, a a, 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 a royalty and all that kind of stuff, but he was forced to move out into the wilderness. He was forced to work out into the magic. And how did he live? He surrounded himself with a group of like-minded people called the Merry Men and Maid Marian, who all had different talents, but with those talents together, they were able to fight off the uh, constant well, we'll call it temptation of the city or the evils of the city or the dangers of the city. I don't think any of us can do it alone. Uh, we all need our own group of merry men. And boy, that's tough to find. Uh, each one of those merry men, you can go right down, and each one of them had a special talent that was unique to helping the whole group, not just themselves. Uh, none of those talents on their own could make it, but all of them together in the aggregate managed to establish uh, a really great life that was balanced between the dangers of the city and the magic of the woods. And I think probably all of us need to find that group of people. Um, and I don't know how to do it. I really don't. Because people like that are few and far between. The internet should make it easier. I would think, because we could find, I mean, I, some of my best friends right now, I've never met in my life. I have uh, friends in England. I have a, a, a musician friend in India who's done a lot of music for my YouTube stuff and, and audio books. Um, I have a couple of friends right now who live in Portugal. Uh, I've never met any of them personally. We've been on Skype together sometimes, or we, we email back and forth quite a bit. But that's how far you got to go to find some of those people uh, who can really do it. Uh, I, I don't think just having a big following on Facebook is, is going to be the answer. I don't think having a big following on Twitter is going to be the answer. It has to be those unique people whose talents blend with yours to create a community, whether it's real or virtual, that can sustain the bombardment of temptations that come to us through this kind of universe, uh, this uh, lifestyle that we've created. Um, like it or not, you know, people talk about a world community and everybody's world, oh, we, terrible one world government, horrible, horrible. Well, my community is a worldwide government. Uh, and I don't even know how some of these people uh, feel about other things that we never talked about. I just know that um, we were somehow brought together, I like to say by magic, uh, we were brought together because one of them read my books or one of them um, contacted me for this or I contacted them for that or whatever. And it's just it's just there. I, I do think that you can find that community. It, it does exist all over the world. A number of years ago, I was asked to go to Cornwall to give a, uh, a seminar on the roots of world religion a group called the Parallel Community had me over. And I, I talked to them, and I'll tell you, I don't even remember most of their names, but some of them, the ones who I stayed with before and after the seminar and the ones who were there, and we went dowsing together and we went out hiking together and all this kind of stuff, uh, I consider them some of my best friends I've ever had. And uh, it is it is a worldwide community. So the people that we need, the, our band of merry men, they're out there. We just need to find them, and that's that's tough. I'd love to give you some ideas about saying, if you do this, you will find them, or if you do that. I think serendipity brings us together more than anything else. I think we have to have our eyes open to that person who is um, just something in us says contact them. For instance, um, I had uh, a wonderful conversation uh, over the course of about two or three years long distance through email with uh, with Dean Radin out in California. Um, and that all ha came about because he had said something in a book which I, which I couldn't quite understand. So I wrote, him an, I wrote him an email. You know, I didn't expect him to ever answer. He wrote back within an hour or two. 
And we started over the next course of the next two or three years, we had this big conversation going about, uh, you know, what it was like to talk about consciousness and uh, uh, what he calls magic and I call magic. And in the course of things, I discovered, lo and behold, he, he plays the violin. He's a concert violinist, but he also loves bluegrass fiddle music. Now, I never would have found that out, you know, <laughs> otherwise. So I think we have to be open to those things. But that's the only answer. Uh, you can't do it alone. Well, and there's, there tends to be, I think, a reaction for a lot of people that they think they need to organize groups mm -hmm. and go the activist route and all of that. Yeah. And that can sometimes lead to a further strengthening of the ego. You know, yeah. as in, you know, I'm going to be the savior of the world or, or my community. Yeah. yeah. Whereas yeah. it almost organically unfolding yeah uh colin fletcher who i have written to back and forth to before he died we had a correspondence going it was before email so we had to do it over with letters but he is uh, the original backpacker the granddaddy of backpackers everywhere the the walker and he is a a confirmed um environmentalist and when he did his long uh, river trip, he wanted to take a raft and go the length of the, Co of the Colorado River from the source to the sea. And uh, along the way, he had to put in at all the dams that were built along the Colorado River. And he would meet the guys in the, uh, in, who ran the dam, who invariably would meet him and offer to get out their trailers and trailer him around the dam and put him down it. And he said he ran into a, a terrible thing because he said all the environmentalists that are supposed to be my friends is I don't like many of them. They're too strident. <laughs> you know, they have all these rules and you got to play by the rules and you got to have the right doctrine and the right dogma. He said, on the other hand, the guys who ran the dams, which I'm morally opposed to, all were universally really nice people who I enjoyed as people. We just disagreed about, you know, building dams across rivers. So I, I think you're absolutely right when you say sometimes uh, uh, the, the people who want to get together and organize sometimes can be so driven and so insisting on my way, but the highway, it, it kind of gets in the way of being human, doesn't it? Yeah, I think, I think so. Well, since we talked about uh, community, what are some thoughts you have as we kind of bring our discussion about this uh, to a close about what we can do individually uh, about our ego's uh, struggle for domination over ourselves and our, our world? Have you found some things that have been helpful uh, to kind of keep that balance and to keep it in check so it doesn't go too far one way or another? Yeah. Well, that, that takes us to the third book, doesn't it? <laughs> Snow White, you're, you're good at this. Paul. <laughs> yeah. Um, what Snow White did was flee to the wilderness and, and there, there she lived with the seven dwarves and eventually evil still reached out to her there and she ate the poisoned apple. Uh, here's where Walt Disney really messed us up because he has Snow White eating the poisoned apple that the wicked queen back in the castle who symbolizes the modern lifestyle and all, uh, you know, the, who was the fairest of them all, you know, and couldn't stand the competition, gave her the poisoned apple and she ate of it. And uh, the dwarves uh, being quite handy, built her this beautiful casket. And uh, there at, when she was seemingly dead or dying, um, Walt Disney has the prince coming and giving her a kiss and waking her with a kiss, you know, man's always going to solve the problem, you know, but that wasn't in the original story at all. What happened in the original story was she was still in her casket and they were carrying the casket through the woods and they stumbled over a bush. In other words, they stumbled right over the earth itself and in jolting and bringing Snow White back in contact out of that uh, silver golden glass casket she was in entombed in it like we all are entombed uh she came in touch with earth with the earth magic and it jounced the apple right out of her throat and she came awake again i think the key eventually is going to be for all of us to get back in touch with earth magic 
to get back in touch with the earth, um, to once again breathe the air and see the trees and slow down. Um, I was up, I had, when transistor radios were big, that shows how old I am. Uh, I once climbed this big mountain, famous mountain in New Hampshire, Mount Monadnock. And up at the very top, a whole group of kids had gathered up there and they were all excited. And I was up there looking at from this granite top, looking over to the state of New Hampshire. I swear you could see all the way to England if you looked hard enough. And there were these group of kids. They were all excited standing around in a circle. And I walked over and I says, what's up? What's up? And they said, man, the reception you get up here on your transistor radio. <laughs> and I said, turn that thing off. Man, it's, yeah, but listen, listen, they wanted me to hear the music and, and all. I didn't climb this mountain to listen to a transistor radio, but they did. Uh, almost anywhere you go nowadays, you're going to find people looking at their handheld devices, whatever they're called, their smartphones and doing all that. It's, it's just uh, all this temptation, it, it takes us away what in heaven's name is going to happen to the world if we turn everything off for a day? You, know, you say, oh, I could do that. Okay, try it. I dare you. I've never found anybody who could take me up on it. Uh, I have difficulties even doing it nowadays, you know, just turning everything off for a day or two. I find myself saying, who's trying to get in touch with me? Maybe something happened. You know, I, I got to connect, got to connect, got to connect. Well, we want to know what trouble is, what to do about it. That's the first thing. Turn off, unplug, get back into the world. Me, I retired and came up here to the woods. And I've been living here in the woods, basically a hermit's life for 13 years. Days go by when I don't hear or see anybody. And even still, I'm connected through the computer. I'm connected through fiber optic cable. And uh, I, I hardly, I mean, I always talk about turning off, but hardly a day goes by when I don't turn on my computer usually first thing in the morning, turn it off last thing at night. It, it's hard. I, I'd love to say do what I do, but I'm not even a good example of it. Uh, but I think that's what's going to take. And the question now is, are we willing to do it? Frankly, from what I see, I think not. So does that mean we're doomed? Well, we're doomed to what was. Maybe something better will come out of it. I just don't know. I don't know. Uh, but we're in a deeply divided transition point right now. We are at that point of Merlin where uh, the world has had to make a choice. Am I going to go with Merlin's magic or am I going to go with Arthur's city? And uh, well, here we go. Um, I don't know. Sometimes I, sometimes I despair, to be honest. Uh, maybe I'm not getting a good impression. But from what I see, I'm, I'm, I'm worried. I really am worried. I, I believe that the human race as a race is standing at a crossroads. We have the technology, but do we have the wisdom to use it correctly? I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. We have dangerous toys. Yeah, my grandmother said that uh, if she could have one wish fulfilled, it wouldn't be wealth. It would be wisdom. Yeah. Because wisdom yeah. may help you get wealth. And they yeah. also help you have great relationships and all. So yeah, yeah. I guess if we have one prayer, it should be for wisdom. Yeah. And, 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 and you know, it, it gets, it gets pretty serious when you stop to think about it because you tend, you generally tend to turn to elders for wisdom. Well, that's great, but who are the elders now? They're people my age and we've been raised in this culture. So now the wisdom that normally we would turn to for our elders are people who have, uh, been raised in the very system that we need wisdom to defeat. And it scares me a little bit. Uh, so I, I don't know, you know, people turn to me as if I have all these answers and, you know, I get emails all the time to my website, you know, can you help me with this? Can you help me? And I try to, I try to say what I can, but I have to make perfectly honest that, uh, wow, I'm, I'm caught up in it too. You know, all of us are where, where is the wisdom? Um, wisdom says we can, you know, uh, divide the atom. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, knowledge says we can divide the atom and crack the atom. Wisdom says, okay, we can, should we? Uh, 
wisdom knowledge says, well, we need a better economy. So we need to build more houses and build more things and build more and do more and get more. Wisdom says, is that the way to go? Uh, and it's, it's difficult. <laughs> I do a lot of, I did a lot of bicycling. And when you bicycle through the cities nowadays, the one thing you're conscious of is where's the front porch? <laughs> it's gone. They don't build houses with front porches anymore where people used to go after dinner and sit around and talk. That was where wisdom came from. Yeah, I, I think uh, you're, you're correct. It's the, uh, the uh, what I call the farmer philosophy. Sometimes the old farmer had uh, so much to offer, even though their life was so simple, because they'd see the, the natural cycle, cycles of life mm -hmm. and they could uh, almost accept more because they saw that things live, things die, you know, every season, turn, turn, yes. turn, is the bird yeah. uh, saying, uh, you know, those kind of uh, 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 thoughts. But I think, Jim, I think you're doing your part uh, as an elder and certainly talking to me today has given folks a little bit different perspective on the, the role of ego and, and, and how uh, we do need that balance. Mm -hmm. So, uh Real quick, uh, if somebody does want to get in touch with you or, or find out more about your work, where's the best place for them to go? Oh, please, please do. Uh, easiest thing to do is to go to my webpage, which is www.jimwillis.net. Um, and that will also give you a, a link down at the bottom of the page. It'll give you a link to my Facebook page and my YouTube page. Um, but uh, on that website, jimwillis.net, there is a contact page and uh, you can send me an email. Uh, I love to talk to people. You and I can talk like this, and it's, it's wonderful. We can see each other, but we have no idea who's out there listening. And I'd like to hear from the people who are out there listening. And uh, uh, I, I'll, I'll try hard. If, if, if a lot of people write, I'll try not to be proud. And if, not, if nobody writes, I'll try not to be discouraged. But uh, <laughs> it's, just, it's just nice to know that uh, we are a community, even though we may not know the other people exist. We are out there. There is a group out there who, who really understands and, and is trying. And if we can help each other, by golly, maybe we can get through this. Yeah. Well, Jim, thank you so much for uh, talking with me about this topic today. And uh, I'm sure we will uh, we'll follow up with uh, more interesting uh, discussions. In great, the future. great. Real good. Thanks, Paul. Always good talking with you. Oh, thank you. Take care.